Yeah, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. We're going to talk about children today, uh, children who are abducted and missing. And uh, this is a particularly poignant subject, given the fact that uh, Russia has kidnapped, abducted thousands of children from Ukraine, which have not been returned, which are being retrained and reprogrammed in Russia. And of course, because of the hostages uh, in Israel and Hamas, Gaza, which have been abducted and which are still being held hostage, including very small children. It's so painful for their parents and such a tragedy. And the tragedy is not yet over. These tragedies don't go away quickly. So we have uh, two people on the show, Sharon Young, who experienced a, an abduction back, uh, what, 30 some odd years ago. It's just very so, interesting to hear about as as the mother of uh, how many children? Two or three children? Three. Three. And uh, uh, Amanda Leonard, who is uh, with the um, Missing Child Center here in Hawaii, which is uh, connected with the Attorney General's office. But as she mentioned before the show, she doesn't practice as a, a Deputy Attorney General. She practices with the uh, Missing Children's Center. Um, to find missing children, uh, you know, and actually it's enviable to think of the good work that you do in bringing children back to their parents. Anyway, so let's start. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, Thank you for, for having us. us. Let's start with you, Sharon. Talk about your experience in 1990 or so uh, with your three um, children. How did that work? August 1st, 1991, my ex-husband um, came to our home, and while I was at work, he abducted our three children. Um, they didn't really know what was going to happen to them, but he enticed them with gifts and um, got them. He said, oh, we're going on a secret adventure. And my son actually thought, wow, this is like, you know, really neat stuff. Um, until they were taken into Mexico and everything changed dramatically. He was a very abusive man. And uh, my son was able to escape about three years after he was abducted. My How two old daughters, were they when they were abducted? 13, 11, and 9. Okay. And your son escaped. He was He was the one who was 13 at the time. No, he was the middle one. He was 11, and when he came back to Hawaii, he turned uh, 14 a couple months later, but he was 13 years old when he escaped. And the other two? They're now in the United States. Both of them are on the East Coast. Um, um, I continue to try to reach out to them and see if I can connect, um, but I I can't always find them uh i and a couple of years ago my oldest daughter reached out to me um out of the blue and said oh i want to do a counseling session it has to be on this particular day at this time and i was not going to be in hawaii i was going to be off island and i asked if we could change it to a couple of days before or later i never heard from her again <laughs> The, these these kids are now uh, at least in their forties. Forties, yeah. And they're emancipated. Forty. Wow. 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 Forty-six, and, forty-three, and one will be forty-two December thirty-first. So they've been brainwashed. I mean, even my son was afraid to come home. Their father told him I was a practicing witch and I could cast spells on him. And I mean, I was just appalled at. The stories I heard, plus all the abuse that was going on. This is psychological abuse or physical abuse? Physical and psychological. So what about your husband? Did he uh, have to account for this? The only way I was able to get him to account for it was to take him back to court. The state of Hawaii dismissed the felony warrants against him after about 10 years. They didn't believe he'd leave Mexico, but he was just waiting for them to um, 
you know, get rid of the felony warrant. And then he immediately came back into the United States. He hates Mexico, actually. And um, so anyway, I was searching for my youngest daughter. I found out she was living with her father. I called the missing child center and they said they couldn't find any felony warrants. So the only thing I had left was the back child support, which he never paid. He told me if I ever left him, he would never pay any child support. And on top of that, he would abduct the kids and take them into Mexico and I'd never see them again. So I was, I stayed with him much longer than I should have because I knew what kind of person he was <laughs> and I didn't take his threats lightly. Sounds like so. our relationships with you know, your relationships, each one of these kids has been mm, um, adversely affected by what your husband did. Am I right? Oh, yeah. And that's why even 30, you know, 25 plus years after the abduction, I took him back to court um, mm -hmm. in Virginia. I moved the case um, from Hawaii to Virginia because Hawaii's child support enforcement agency is actually pretty horrible. Um, and the Virginia Child Support Enforcement Agency is much better. And, you know, I beat him in court in 2013. So finally, after 20, 30 years, he's finally paying back child support. <laughs> and I'm using that to pay down my son's student loans. If my ex-husband lives long enough to pay off the debt, then I'll be able to help my younger daughter, who I know has substantial student loans. Um, but I don't know if that'll happen. Yeah, 30 years. Uh, it seems to me this has, in many ways, defined your life. It has. I mean, good things, obviously, have come out of this, the Missing Child Center. And I was, I would call myself crazy with anger. But that anger, I knew had to be channeled into something positive, and the outcome of that was the Missing Child Center Hawaii. Can you talk about your efforts, to, you know, the reasons and your efforts to found it? Well, my efforts were because I was so angry. We had nothing in Hawaii to recover children. The police department was, I mean, they should have gotten the FBI involved shortly afterwards because they knew that he had taken them out of the state, but they didn't follow protocol. One of the police officers told me this is what should have been done, but they didn't do it. And um, and I knew he was going to take them into Mexico. So we weren't able to stop him. And, you know, ironically, my next door neighbor, who my kids played with, spotted them in the San Francisco Hertz rent-a-car um, facility the next morning. And they called me. And the police didn't want to do anything. They said, oh, this is a domestic. I said, it's not. We're divorced. This is what's in the divorce decree. You know, I need you people to get involved to help. Um, I ended up having to call my client, Douglas Gibb, who ex-chief of police, who was retired at the time. And he actually got the police to help me. I mean, I've had all these possibilities of stopping my ex, but you know, the system within the police department was just not well suited to recovery of children. So that's why I did this. I met a woman, Pam Ferguson Bray, an attorney, and, and we worked together to lobby the legislature and, you know, do studies on what the missing child centers were effective. And January 1st, 1995, the Missing Child Center Hawaii was came into being. Mm -hmm. And since then, it, it, it actually, they actually um, found my two daughters. I mean, at the time, I had spent so much money on legal fees, I just didn't have any more money. Um, and I stopped hiring, I stopped paying all these attorneys in Mexico, I had a civil and criminal attorney there. Uh, you get nowhere. I, and I lived in Mexico with my ex-husband um, earlier. And, you know, the way to do things is to pay people off, but I didn't know who to pay off. And um, plus, I didn't have, I wasn't rolling in dough. Mm -hmm. So um, 
basically the missing child center found my kids. Um, you, you mentioned Douglas Gibbs uh, was your uh, client. What, what kind of business are you in? I'm a financial advisor and I, I know my company doesn't want me to give. Okay. That's fine. Money. I just want to know in general. <laughs> so yeah. Amanda, you know, you got involved with the missing child center. When and why? Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Think Tech Hawaii. First, I want to commend Sharon for her courage to come forward and share her experience as a survivor of an international parental abduction so that other parents and children won't have to suffer like she and her kids did. Uh, I came on board as the coordinator of Missing Child Center Hawaii, known as MCCH, in uh, 2018. Prior to that, I was a family law attorney. Uh, in private practice for about six years. Um, and so thanks to Sharon, uh, there was an office that I could uh, work for and serve families and children uh, without having to charge them anything for our services. And it's just been an incredible honor and privilege to do so. So are you the only one working with the Missing Child Center or do you have a staff of 200? Well, you have the right number, too. Uh, our staff is two people. No zero, zero after it. Uh, we are a staff of two two people, uh, myself and the assistant coordinator. And we actually cover the entire state of Hawaii. And we serve as the state's official missing children clearinghouse. And I am also the Miley Amber Alert coordinator for the state. And as you mentioned, we are the State Department of the Attorney General. So uh, we talked before the show about, uh, you know, the, 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 the demographics on this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get I get the uh, idea that most of the cases where children are missing uh, and come to your attention are, uh, I hate to use this term, because Sharon was trying to avoid using this term when she was talking to the authorities, um, but they're domestic cases. They're um, one parent steals the children away from the other. Uh, am I right about that? Most of the cases are domestic type abductions, right? Well, most of the cases at our office are endangered runaways because that is one of the categories of missing children that we respond to. But when you're talking about abductions or kidnappings, uh, it will mostly be a parental abduction. Stranger abductions are extremely rare in Hawaii as, and also rare nationally. So um, I mentioned Miley Amber Alert. That is a tool that we use for the stranger abductions. They can also be used for dangerous parental abductions. And so when we are responding to abductions here at Missing Child Center, most of the times they're going to be uh, parental or family abductions. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, they will hop islands. Sometimes they will leave the state and sometimes they will leave the country. Hmm. But I would imagine most of them really don't don't leave. They stay around and try to hide maybe on a neighbor island or something. Oh, Sharon is shaking her head. Uh, maybe not. Where do they go? What's the what are the numbers on that? Well, it's definitely um, difficult to hide a, a child on one of our islands because the good thing that, about living in Hawaii is it's so small. We have county police on each island. We also have federal law enforcement partners. Uh, usually, if the child is being concealed in state we are able to find that child pretty quickly. It becomes a whole nother matter when the child leaves the, the state or the country. We do see a lot of um, uh, you know, out-of-state abductions and international abductions. And that also is because where we're situated um, globally, it is actually pretty easy to get out of the the state and go to another country, whether it's, um, you know, Mexico, whether it's Asia, whether it's Europe, I handle all of those cases. And don't forget the Middle East. From a yeah. cultural point of view, I, I am personally familiar with um, parents, mostly men, who have abducted their children back into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah. so, uh, you know, uh, what's the, how are these cases reported to you? Do they come directly? Do they come from the police? Um, do they, you know, they come from family? How do you how do you open a file, so to speak? 
Excellent question, Jay. So usually uh, the parents will report the incident to the county or local police department and they will get assigned an investigator and that investigator will either refer the parent directly to us or they'll call us um, and ask for assistance. So our primary obligation under the state law is to assist uh, the law enforcement agencies to locate the children. And the police departments are well aware of that. That is our responsibility uh, to provide that assistance. Um, so it'll it'll either be the police department or the parents will reach out to us directly to assist. I'll open up a case and then we will also refer them to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for additional resources uh, from case assistance to family support services. Uh, they provide all of that to families of missing children for free. Yeah, uh, you you and your number two uh, are, quote, coordinators. Um, but, um, you know, the scenario that Sharon was talking about involved another country mm -hmm. um, far away. Um, it's a federal jurisdiction thing, of course, if that's the case. Um, and I wonder uh, if you are getting the cooperation you want from federal agencies who would have jurisdiction in destinations like East Coast or other countries. Yes, we have excellent partnerships with our uh, law enforcement agencies in the state as well as um, on the mainland. So the Justice Department um, connects all of the clearinghouse managers together. So if there is an incident where a child is taken, let's say to Idaho, I'm able to uh, pull up the information very quickly of who is my counterpart in that state and then make immediate contact and request assistance from that state. So our, our federal partners have made that, um, uh, you know, very, very strong in terms of how to leverage our our resources. We have a lot of agencies here in Hawaii on the federal side that help us, the FBI, Homeland Security, the U.S. Marshals, the U.S. Secret Service. And then, of course, we have our state partners, Child Welfare Services, the judiciary. As the clearinghouse, um, it's my responsibility to coordinate all of these different agencies so that we are leveraging um, all resources possible to get that child recovered. And time is of the essence, and that's why everything needs to be done as quickly as possible. Why is time of the essence, Amanda? Time is of the essence because um, the parent may relocate to another state with the children, but they could also go to another state or another country. They can be on the move. If they are really motivated to conceal the whereabouts of the, these children or child, they will be on the move. And we see these parents going through multiple states back and forth, which makes it extremely hard for us to track them. Uh, luckily, this the information on the missing child uh, is in the national database called NCIC. So they should be flagged at the airports. They should be able to be um, identified by different uh, state law enforcement agencies. And it is absolutely critical that we prevent that child from being taken into more different states or out of the country. Once they're out of the country, it becomes extremely difficult uh, to get them back as Sharon has personally experienced. Well, here's an awful question for you. What's what's your rate of recovery? Are there children that, you know, that are off the grid completely? Are there children who may not have survived? So most missing children are recovered safely. And that's a that's a great thing. That's here locally and of course across the across the country. But there are incidents where the children have not been located. Uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has posters of some of our local kids who were abducted uh, in a parental abduction who have not been found and that their parent is still waiting for answers. And the thing about Missing Child Center and NICMIC is we will never close a case until that child's found. It doesn't matter if that child turns 18 or not, that case will not be closed until that child is found, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, we will keep it open because if there's even 1% chance that we can get that child located and reunited, uh, we will do everything in our power to, to make that happen. So do you prosecute? 
I don't personally prosecute. As you mentioned, I'm not, I'm an attorney, but I'm not a practicing attorney. Um, but these cases can be prosecuted. Um, in Hawaii, the crime is called a, a custodial interference. And um, if the child is taken out of the state or out of the country, it could be a, a felony um, crime. So on the one hand, on the civil side, there's the family court, and that parent is going to be attempting to enforce their custodial rights in family court. On the criminal side, there could be a police investigation of custodial interference uh, where charges could be uh, brought and the prosecutors could pursue and, and bring justice uh, upon that perpetrator. So it's there's two things going on. and It's a very, very difficult legal process. It's a extremely difficult, painful, emotional process. Uh, these are the most um, intricate, complex, difficult cases uh, that you could possibly imagine. And I, as an attorney, I used to um, have cases where the kids, uh, uh, my client's children were abducted. So I know how difficult it is. But the main thing is that the parents are acting quickly, that they are doing everything that they can to start that process, um, filing the police report, uh, registering court orders uh, in in the state that they're they believe the children may be. There's many different things that they should be doing, uh, but it's absolutely imperative that they seek out those resources so that we can act respond quicker. You know, if you do have any uh, any uh, prosecutions of people who steal away children, uh, I appreciate you call me up because I would like to volunteer to be on the jury. I, I, <laughs> I have a few. Uh, I appreciate bias. your passion, Jay. It's a it's an <laughs> absolutely horrible thing to happen to a parent, and that is why Sharon coming forward to share her experience is so commendable. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're putting that information out there because a lot of the times it can be preventable. Um, some of the times it can't be. By um, therapy, by, by intervention, how do you prevent this? Well, it's definitely important for parents to uh, look at the risk factors. So, you know, Sharon mentioned earlier that um, her ex-husband threatened to abduct the children. That is a huge red flag. Now, most people wouldn't think that someone's capable of carrying out that threat, uh, mostly because it's a crime. And we don't think that uh, people would threaten to commit a crime, um, something of this nature. But definitely be aware of the threats. Um, if there's a history of domestic violence, child abuse, um, you know, fighting over the child, um, if that parent has a criminal record or, or ties to another state or country, mm -hmm. you know, be mindful, um, do what you can. Uh, the, the State Department does have a program to flag passports, um, and that's definitely something that um, if you've been threatened with this, uh, that you may want to look up. Well, who do they call? So the U.S. Department of State has an Office of Children Issues, and these are the folks that um, come into play if if there is an attempted or a successful parental of, of international parental abduction. Um, they do have a program where you can request uh, that the that a child's passport be flagged or try to prevent that child from getting a passport. It's a lot harder now because I guess the good thing about the Patriot Act and because so much is uh, required in order to get a passport to begin with, that if you have an agency, the passport agency that will uh, will not issue a passport or will flag it so that if someone's using the passport to leave the country, they can stop them there. So um, that that is a good thing because once a child is taken out of the country, uh, then you're dealing with international laws. And, uh, they may not be um, helpful. There's something called the Hague Convention it's a reciprocal agreement between countries, but even if they've signed on to the Hague, um, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get the child back. 
Mm -hmm. so, Sharon, I want to ask you a, a question about about the defenses, you know, the justification or uh, arguable justifications that people have in, in uh, wrongfully removing children. I mean, for example, if it's a shared custody and this guy, this hypothetical spouse, takes off with the children and says, you know, I'm just exercising my shared custody rights. Um, is that the same thing as uh, as kidnapping a child? Well, to be honest with you, the most frequent times children are abducted, parental abductions, are during summer and Christmas vacation. And that's why we wanted to talk about this uh, prior to Christmas, because there are um, things that parents can do if they suspect they're having a difficulty with their spouse, and the spouse may, or the parent, they may not even be married, um, may want to take the child out of the country or out of the state. You know, I'm, if they're in Hawaii, I would say call Amanda, call the Missing Child Center, and they can give a number of things that the parents can do to thwart that. There's no good reason for doing this. I mean, to be honest with you, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, states that in most cases, if it's a parental abduction, it's an attempt to punish the other parents. In cases, parents will murder children to punish the other parent. They will torture their children. My son was tortured. Um, they will beat. They will, you know, do all sorts of horrible things to the children because they know that's the most effective way to punish the parent, um, the other parent. And yeah. they're not doing it for the benefit of the children. No, but, but, no but a third party may be listening to this uh, spouse who takes the children away. And maybe the spouse has a shared custody arrangement. Maybe they're not married and there's no you know, law, no document governing exactly who has custody. He just takes them away. Um, well, now, is that is that something where the uh, missing child center can do something? Uh, yeah. You, you're assuming that if he takes them away, it's not They're okay, gonna... but it, it could be okay, right? He could argue well, that it's okay. Well, that's where if a parent believes that their child may be subject to a parental abduction by contacting somebody, Amanda or Calais, they can start the process. That, that, that parent is going to have to get an attorney and is going to have to start some sort of legal action to make it so that they can't just take the child anytime they want willy-nilly. Even if they're not married, they may have some type of shared custody, but you know there are rules within that. And I would say if you, if they believe that their child may be abducted, start the process of reaching out to somebody like Amanda to help guide them on what they can do to protect their child. Because if they are abducted, then it becomes much more difficult. A footnote um, on that, Amanda, what is your website address so that people can find you? Well, it's a very, very long website. So I'm just going to say Google Missing Child Center Hawaii because it's a very long attorney general type state. <laughs> but our phone number is 808-586-1449. You know, I, in writing my book, one of the things that I did in, in the appendix is to give resources, you know, where people could find help if they think something like this might happen to them. And then um, other tools, you know, to be aware of, you know, keeping um, pictures of your children on a regular basis even of the parent, because if a child is abducted, um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children can age enhance pictures of the child. What's helpful, they want pictures of both parents at different ages to help them age enhance pictures of the children. Um, so I have a number of different things that people can do if they think something like this may happen to their children. To better protect them. But it's good to be proactive <laughs> with, you know, that's really important to be proactive. Let's talk about your book. You wrote a book, Sharon. Can you talk about the book? Yes. Um, I just, it took me 15 years. <laughs> and I know this is like 32 years after my children were abducted. But, you know, 
in my attempt, uh, the first thing that I would say it was my attempt to reach out to my daughters because I know they've been brainwashed. And since I don't have the facility to speak with them or communicate with them, um, how can I undo any of that? I can't. And so I decided, well, you know, if I can't, you know, reconnect with my daughters, then maybe what I can do is find a way to give other people caught in this ugly dilemma um, and give them ideas on how they can protect themselves and their children. And so it took a long time because I did write the book by myself. It, I had to take all these writing classes and, <laughs> you know. And, you were really and determined. I, <laughs> yes, I was very determined. And like I said, I took my ex. When I found he came back into the United States, I, I included that too. And I learned lots of legal things that parents can do that I wasn't even aware of um, until, you know, we went to, back to court to get him to pay back child support. And so um, it, it's so complicated. And all these different states are literally competing with each other, you know, for child support. I mean, that's something I was not aware mm, of. They all want. Um, they all want to uh, collect from the same individual. Interesting. Well, well, because they they're given benefits. That, that was one of the things. Uh, Texas told me I should close the case in Hawaii. I was at the point of starting to get money from my ex, and they wanted me to close the case in Hawaii. I needed to get you know, copies of the, our divorce decrees in order to, you know, initiate the payment. And they said, oh, you should close it and then move it to Texas. And I said, uh, the, and then they said, oh, I'd have to pay to come and go to Texas, you know, for any kind of filings. And I'm like, I said, does Texas make more money if they can say that they recovered the money from my ex? And they said, oh, yeah. The federal government uh, gives us more money. And may so I'm I like, say, oh, okay. <laughs> leave it to Texas, will you? Actually, Texas has a pretty good um, system, which um, Amanda told me that they have actually um, that more protections in Texas than most states. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I wasn't going to wait another five years. And then if he moved, that's the other thing. It's like I'd have to find where he's moving to. And I, you know, and um, it's not simple. It's better Abduction to be proactive. and Justice is the name of your book. Yeah. Where, where can I find your book? Well, actually, it won't be available until the end of November. And you can go to www.bookswiths.hawaii.net. It's um, through Legacy Watermark Publishing here in Hawaii. I got so tired of having to edit, edit, edit with these different literary agents. I said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to self-publish it because otherwise I'll be doing this for the next 15 years and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, Amanda, let me, let me, uh, you know, you're going to consult with Sharon. She's kind of, she's been around the block on this. She's written a book on it. She's had personal difficult experience on it. Is, is uh, Sharon somebody you talk to? It, does she is she talk to you? Does she is she <clears throat> close to your organization? Sharon is one of the first people when I started in 2018 that fully embraced me coming into the position. Uh, one of the first people I met, and to learn that she one is a survivor parent, and two is the person who pushed for the establishment of missing child center so that Hawaii can have a clearinghouse to serve these families is incredible. I have the utmost respect for Sharon. Uh, she and I are always been in contact over the past five years. Sometimes we'll get coffee. We'll talk about, you know, just in general, you know, what we think uh, is needed uh, to improve our system response for missing and abducted children. I consult with her. Um, and having that survivor perspective is absolutely crucial uh, to me in, in my work. Mm -hmm. And so I've just been so grateful to have her uh, mentorship, her friendship, her partnership. Um, and actually, if yeah. I can make any profit from this book, I, I'm trying to figure out a way 
to get it to the missing child center. But the difficulty I have is they're with the attorney general's office. So it's a state agency. And I'm currently looking for a small nonprofit that might be willing to work in conjunction with us to help support the endeavors of the missing child center. Um, but it has to be done in such a way where, you know, they would know that, that I might be able to give them would be used to support. And I feel your determination will prevail. Um, and I and I would say uh, we all owe you a debt of gratitude, Sharon, for having taken a tragedy and and uh, making it into public service. It's it's really commendable what you've done. Well, that saved me because otherwise I'd be a very bitter, messed up human being. <laughs> I don't think Honestly. you are that today. And Amanda, <laughs> thank you for your service. It's very important that you do what you do, and somehow I believe that. Um, not only do you recover children who have been abducted, but in doing so, in, in maintaining this effort, you reduce the number of children who are abducted in the first place. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Thank for, you for raising awareness of this issue, which yes, thank nobody you. talks about this. Nobody wants to talk yeah. about divorce or, or parental abductions, mm -hmm. but we can help so many people by making sure that they know that you can do something. There are resources available. Mm -hmm. We are here to help you. Okay. And, and I really feel that it is a very painful experience to have a, a child abducted and Lord knows what happens to that child away from the family. It's it's an attack on the family is what it is, not only the spouse. Um, so but what you know, the, is... the really, the really uh, <clears throat> difficult situation is that child. Because even though my son you know, has done very well for himself. We spent years in counseling. It's very difficult when a child comes back. It's very I'm, I'm hard. sure it is. I'm sure it is. Thank you, Sharon Young. Thank you, Amanda. Thank Keep you up the, the good work and uh, make our community secure. Thank you so much.